The best science now shows that human activities are changing the composition of the air, which is changing temperature, storms, sea level, and other things. The changes so far have been small, and whether the coming changes will be much bigger depends on decisions that we will make. Burning fossil fuels for energy releases carbon dioxide. Consider your car. You do a fill-up, you put 100 pounds of gas in, and you drive away. As you burn that 100 pounds of gas, you add oxygen, and that makes 300 pounds of CO2 that drift away in the atmosphere. If it came out of the tailpipe the way waste came out of our transportation 100 years ago, as horse ploppies, it's a pound per mile driving down the road. We would cover every road in America an inch deep every year. That may not seem like a lot, but that's the roads out in the desert. That's all the roads. And just think about jogging in it for a minute and think what it would smell like. And cars are just part of it. Anytime we burn fossil fuels, coal or oil or natural gas, we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is invisible to our eyes. If we had special sensitive infrared goggles, we could see the carbon dioxide coming out of the tailpipes and drifting across the landscape, hanging like a pall over the planet. So what does this mean? Naturally, the sun heats the planet, the Earth sends energy back to space, and the atmosphere traps some of that energy and keeps the Earth warmer so we're not frozen and we can live here. As we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, more of the sun's energy that the Earth is sending back to space is trapped by the atmosphere, and that makes us warmer still. So as we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, the world warms. We've known about the warming effect of carbon dioxide for almost two centuries. As we burn gas and oil and other fossil fuels and add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we expect the world to warm. The world is warming. Thermometers show this, even thermometers far from the heat of the city, thermometers in the ocean, deep in rock and in soil, aloft on balloons, even special thermometers on satellites looking down on the Earth show the world is warming. The permafrost is melting, sea ice is disappearing, glaciers are shrinking, even those getting more snowfall. Here is the Muir Glacier in Alaska, photographed in 1941. Here is the same glacier, photographed from the same perspective, in 2004. But is the warming today really being caused by rising amounts of carbon dioxide? A big volcano can send particles into the air, which blocks the sun and cools us for a few years. Tens of thousands of years ago, the Earth's orbit changed, bringing us a bit more warmth and taking us out of an ice age. Many things can cause climate to change. Geologic observations show us that ancient climate has ranged from cold to hot and back again over millions of years. But what about today? Are natural processes causing the world to warm? So we take what we know about the climate and the natural factors that we think are important, changes in solar output, the influence of volcanic eruptions, and we put that into computer model simulations. The simulations are then able to reproduce the temperature changes that were actually observed and measured up until about 1900, but they cannot reproduce the 20th century warming. It's only when we add the influence of human beings, the increased greenhouse gas concentrations due to fossil fuel burning, that we're able to explain the overall observed 20th century warming. These same models tell us that if we continue to burn fossil fuels at current rates, let alone increasing rates, we're likely to see considerably greater warming in the future. So we've seen that temperatures have gone up over the last 150 years. But that's nothing compared to where they could go over the next couple of centuries. We've just started on this warming trend. We have a lot more coal and oil to burn, and every year we burn more and more of it. If we continue to increase our carbon dioxide production globally, this warming trend could increase significantly. So far, surface temperatures have only gone up by about one degree Fahrenheit. 
However, the same computer models that correctly predicted this increase show that by the end of this century, surface temperatures could increase by four to seven degrees Fahrenheit. And if we stay on this same trend for the next 300 years, global surface temperatures could increase by a whopping 14 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've only just begun to increase carbon dioxide levels. If we continue to do so, the warming could be very large. But what will the warming mean? More warm weather will have significant impacts to life on Earth. As glaciers melt and the ocean water warms and expands, sea levels will rise. For instance, with a five meter rise in sea level, almost one fifth of the state of Florida may be covered with water. Almost one fourth of the state of Louisiana will be affected. And let's say one third of a low laying country like Bangladesh will be affected. Now with a sea level rise of 25 meters, almost all of Bangladesh may be underwater and most likely most of the American West Coast may be underwater as well. Tropical diseases most likely will spread into new territories such as malaria in Europe and the United States. And transmission rates are likely to increase and in some cases, as in Europe, are likely to double. Also, many places where we grow our crops today may dry up during the summer. Now, initially, there will be winners and losers, with most harm coming to poor people in warm places. Africa is most likely the continent that will be most affected and most vulnerable, with more and more frequent droughts and floods to come. Yet, most studies show that harm will spread until it affects almost everyone almost everywhere. Past greenhouse gas emissions have already caused sizable risks for future generations. What are we to do now? In the past, societies have often chosen to reduce pollution in order to increase welfare. We have chosen to introduce sewers in order to reduce the risk due to human waste. Or we have chosen to change the way we do air conditioning and spray cans in order to reduce the risks of the ozone hole. In a similar way, reducing greenhouse gas emissions changes and reduces the risks of future climate change. How can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? There are several ways. Right now, we can switch to fluorescent light bulbs, or we can take the bike instead of the car. We can start to sequester greenhouse gases into the ground. In the long run, we can substitute fossil fuels with energies derived from the wind, the sun, or biomass. The evidence suggests that the costs of reducing greenhouse gas emissions are less than the costs of inaction. So what does this all mean? The people, the policymakers, have paid scientists real money to find out what is likely to happen. We see humans changing the composition of the air. We see this affecting the climate, the temperature, the storms, the sea level. The science is good. The data are there. This is real. It's real. It's real. There are solutions. There are things that can be done. The science is solid. It's now back to the people, back to the policymakers to decide what to do. The scientific evidence clearly demonstrates that a continuation of business as usual greenhouse gas emissions will lead to significant changes in our climate, increasing risks to human welfare and to ecosystems. There's much we can do to reduce these risks by lowering greenhouse gas emissions. The question of how much risk we can impose on future generations is, in the end, an ethical question. Thank you.